Turkey sees continued restructuring at the top echelons of its military ranks. We look at what those changes could mean for the second largest army in NATO. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Ali Mustafa and this is Straight Talk. In any other year, a routine meeting by Turkey's Supreme Military Council would probably have gone unnoticed. But these aren't ordinary times. In the aftermath of last year's coup attempt, all eyes have been closely watching which direction Turkey's armed forces take. Last week, approval was given to change the country's top military leadership. The Army, Navy and Air Force commanders were replaced with new generals. Analysts and officials are already poring over what it all could mean for a military already engaged in a battle against terrorism. Omer Kablan reports. This is one of the Turkish military's top bases in Istanbul, where generals and commanders coordinate the country's strategy against threats. But things are changing inside. There's been a major overhaul in how the military operates. There are new army, naval and air force commanders. And it happens at a moment when the military's role is set to expand. The decisions to restructure the leadership of the armed forces came after a high-level meeting known as the Supreme Military Council. Prior to the July 15 attempted coup, the Turkish armed forces had 325 commanders. Immediately after, the number of military leaders went down to 196. After certain high-ranking generals were charged with having links to the Gulenist cult. Now, a year later, the number stands at 228. Speaking on the changes in the military's high command, Prime Minister Bin Ali Yildirim said, Our aim is a renewed and capable Turkish armed forces that can defend our country against threats from the region and the world. The Turkish armed forces is one of the most powerful militaries in the world. It's the second largest in NATO, with 700,000 active personnel and 40 million reserves. The Turkish army has 7,000 armoured vehicles and tanks and over 1,000 fighter aircraft, including F-16s. The Turkish armed forces are a global force that has played a significant role in the United Nations peacekeeping forces with active roles in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars. All this firepower and the new leadership will now be at the disposal of the state in its next possible mission which, according to President Erdogan, might be around the corner. Bırak kalkan harekatı ile Suriye'deki terör oluşumu projesinin kalbine soktuğumuz hançeri yeni hamlelerle genişletmekte kararlıyız. Çok yok yakında bu konuda yeni ve önemli adımlarımız olacak. Given the terrorist threats that Turkey faces both internally and externally, the hot pursuit into their havens might enable Turkey to better protect itself and ensure more stability in the region. Umar Kablan, Straight Talk. And joining me now in the studio is Bora Bayraktar. He's a lecturer at Istanbul Kultur University and he's also a former journalist who's covered the Middle East and the Turkish military extensively. Bora, thank you for joining us in the studio. What exactly is Erdogan hinting at when he talks about expanding Turkish military operations? I think there are uh, more than uh, one message here. Uh, first of all, uh, it doesn't mean that Turkey wants to expand its territory. We should, uh, I think, put it in this way. But uh, this is a, a warning uh, to the small uh, groups uh, like uh, extension of PKK in Syria, PYD and other groups. Also, I think in a way uh, he is uh, bargaining uh, with the big powers who are in the field like the US and Russia. Uh, also, we should say that uh, he's trying to underline Turkey's determination and also he sets uh, a deterrence uh, to the parties in the field. So you're saying that this is being used as a means to send a message to powers in Syria, be it Russia, the US? Yes, it's, uh, but at the same time, okay, this is a message, 
but this is also a possibility. I mean, uh, if Turkey needs and feels that it is necessary, uh, Erdogan is saying that Turkey can act because Turkey has this capacity uh, also proved uh, when uh, it sees necessary, Turkey actually did uh, some operations, some air operations uh, also uh, day by day. Uh, if you uh, follow, we, uh, we see that Turkish air forces sometimes hit targets in, in northern Iraq. Also, uh, you know, is hitting uh, with uh, howitzers in Afrin, in other places. Turkey is uh, very active uh, around its border. And a month after the coup, just over a month, you had Operation Euphrates Shield, where the Turkish military went in to clear Jarablus of ISIS, of Daesh, as well as uh, provide a deterrent against the YPG. What would you say to criticism that the Turkish military, after the coup, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, the soldiers and some of the high command was removed of uh, having suspicious ties to Fatal, what would you say to people who say the Turkish military might be stretched to thin, that it doesn't have the operational capacity to expand operations? Uh, I don't agree with that, actually, because uh, Turkish army proved its capacity and capability during the Euphrates Shield operation. It was a time of, you know, chaos. Uh, there was a problem. The morale was uh, low. And also, uh, not only the military coup, but also uh, the army uh, was fighting in southeast of Turkey against PKK and YPG. So uh, they were tired, and at the same time, uh, because of their problems uh, in the army chain of command, lots of problems. But despite this, uh, within six months or so, uh, Turkish army was able to remove Daesh and PKK, PYD uh, from its borders. Uh, last year, I remember when I was in Kilis border town of Turkey, uh, people uh, sent their families, children and uh, women outside of the city because of the falling bombs and missiles. This year, you know, everybody is back home uh, and also uh, you feel a strong sense of security at the border. So this is a success. Now we have, uh, I mean, one year after all this happened, now I think uh, the restructuring of the army, removal of uh, FETO generals and officers outside of the army. So uh, I think the chain of command is stronger, uh, morale is high. Uh, and also Turkish army now uh, is more experienced because of the fighting in southeast of Turkey and also the Euphrates shield. So I think uh, they are in better shape uh, when we compare with the last year. Bora, thank you for joining us. Bora Beraktar joining us in the studio. Still to come on Straight Talk. We look at threats just across Turkey's borders where terror groups are exploiting the power vacuum left by two devastating wars. And Turkey continues to enjoy months of calm. We look at how the country's counter-terrorism strategy is working. Situated in an unstable region that has seen several wars over the past decade, Turkey's external security threats are stark. Several terror groups have risen out of the ashes of the Iraq and Syrian conflicts and now pose a serious risk to Turkey. The Syrian province of Idlib is one of those threats as it recently came under the control of Al-Qaeda-linked HTS terrorists, prompting Turkey to close off the border crossing. But there are more threats in Syria and in Iraq, as Aisha Jamal explains. Two of the deadliest conflicts of the past decade are taking place right on Turkey's doorstep. With hundreds of thousands of casualties from both wars, any escalation can have dramatic effects, including those from terrorist groups who are operating freely within this power vacuum. Idlib in northern Syria has been a flashpoint for the past two years. It's where Turkey shot down a Russian jet in Turkish airspace in 2015, and it's also where the Syrian regime launched a chemical attack earlier this year that left more than 80 dead. Having been held for years by Turkish-backed rebels, an Al-Qaeda affiliate, the HTS, is now threatening to take over the area. If such a scenario were to take place, the power balance could drastically shift, raising the chances of an even wider conflict. On the other hand, Daesh, who made headlines 
after conquering large swaths of Iraq and Syria in 2014, has been pushed back, but not completely, as the group still poses a major security threat to Turkey and its interests in the region. But it's Turkey's old foe, the PKK terrorist group, who has shown the greatest flexibility in exploiting the chaos of both wars. The PKK is currently operating from Kandil and Sinjar in northern Iraq. Over the past few years, the group has been fighting to create a corridor from its bases in Iraq to YPG-held areas in northern Syria. Turkish officials have repeatedly warned that they will not allow Sinjar to come under PKK control. Sinjar yeni bir kandil olma yolunda. Onun için biz Sinjar'a müsaade edemeyiz. Çünkü orada PKK var. But it's in northern Syria where the PKK and its YPG affiliate have seen the most success. For Turkey, there is no distinction between the two groups, and the U.S. accepts this as well. We literally played back to them, hey, you got to change your brand. You know, what, what, what do you want to call yourself besides the YPG? And with about a day's notice, they declared that they were the Syrian Democratic Forces. Uh, I thought it was a stroke of brilliance to put democracy in there somewhere. Yet despite acknowledging the link, the U.S. continues to provide arms to the terror group. And to discuss Turkey's security threats more closely, I'm joined from Ankara by Klaus Jürgens, who is a political analyst. Klaus, thank you for joining us. How much of a threat would it be for Turkey if the YPG and its Turkish affiliate, the PKK terror group, create a seamless corridor from Iraq into northern Syria? Well, first of all, thank you for being on the program. Uh, Memnon Molde, much appreciated. Honestly, I think if it comes to a situation where, as you mentioned, a seamless corridor would be created, it could pose considerable uh, security threats to the Republic of Turkey. I'm not only talking about copycats who might be hiding within the country, but it could have much wider international implications that international observers now say, look, now they have done a fait accompli. We have to give them the right to self-determination. Again, Turkey would be put into a political corner. Everyone would criticize Turkey for not allowing a similar development on its own soil. And uh, I belong to uh, the group of commentators who says we have a single Republic of Turkey. It has to be defended. Ankara has a right to speak up for its own interests, regardless of whether the international community supports it or not. I would see it as a very, very serious threat to the integrity of modern Turkey. You're talking about the international community and specifically let's focus on Russia and the US. The US has supplied weapons to the YPG, which Turkey considers a terrorist organization. Russia now is pushing for the PYD, which is a political wing of the YPG, to be part of the Astana process. Is that a red line for Turkey? Well, I'm following very closely the Astana process and the uh, bilateral and the trilateral meetings. I think it would be very unwise from the side of Moscow to support a faction in the process and inviting them onto the negotiation table. Turkey would, as this word is so often overused, but let me use it one more time, there would be a red line. Uh, none of the two uh, groups you mentioned in, in whatever form should be supported by the international community in the sense of getting their own way, neither by Washington nor by Moscow. I'm sorry, I'm very outspoken about this as well. I would see another grave uh, threat to Turkey. What does Turkey do if its traditional NATO allies aren't listening to it when it comes to the YPG? We're talking about the US here. And if its new allies or in Russia, for example, aren't listening to it when it comes to the PYD. So what does Turkey do then? Well, here comes uh, my diplomatic corner, so to speak, my diplomatic viewpoint. I think Turkey should proceed exactly on what I would refer to as a twin track security and foreign policy. You have to convince your allies about your own viewpoints, whilst at the same time not giving in completely if those allies simply don't want to understand. Klaus Jürgens, thank you for joining us from Ankara. Thank you.
So we've seen how external threats pose a clear and present risk to Turkey. But inside the country, we saw hundreds of people killed in dozens of attacks in the past two years. And last year was no different, where Turkey saw several terrorist attacks that left dozens dead. So how has Turkey responded to these threats? And what counterterrorism policies is it adopting? Courtney Keeley takes a closer look. New Year's Eve in Istanbul. At the exclusive Reina nightclub, the theme was Go to Hell 2016, as the crowd counted down to midnight. Six, five, four, three, two, one. But soon after, a gunman gained entry and opened fire. Abdul Qadir Masharapov, an Uzbek citizen, arrived by taxi, bypassing police checkpoints. 39 people were killed among the crowd of hundreds before Masharapov disappeared among the wounded. Two doors away, Serkan Turker was just about to lock the front gates of his cafe for the night when he saw people running and screaming. Several bartenders that he knew from Reyna sought refuge in his cafe. Reyna was demolished a few months ago. Little remains of what was an international hotspot, and there are no plans to rebuild it. When Daesh took responsibility for the attack, it said it was part of a campaign of violence against Turkey. While the highest number of casualties were Turkish nationals, two-thirds of the people killed were from other countries. According to Turkish officials, 2,000 officers and special forces were deployed to help capture Masharapov and four other suspects. There was a pattern. Six months earlier, in July 2016, Turkey's main international airport came under siege. The three suicide bombers were identified as citizens of Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia. According to the Ministry of Interior's recent report on Daesh, the Turkish military and local police arrested more than 3,500 people on suspicions of links to Daesh. More than 1,400 remain in custody awaiting trial, including 718 alleged foreign fighters. But it's a two-pronged counterterrorism approach. The Turkish government maintains the PKK is still the top threat to Turkey's national security. Less than a month before the Reyna attack, two suicide bombers loyal to an offshoot of the PKK launched dual bombings on football fans outside the Vodafone Stadium after a match, killing 46 Turkish citizens. The stadium is just under four kilometers from the Reyna nightclub. And at the Bosphorus Cafe, business has not returned to normal. But Sefetin Savuk Duran remains a loyal customer. Lot of business suffering. Never can be like before. I don't think so. Because they need times. And that's not easy. The, even the foreigners and even Turkish people, they not go in that kind of place because they're afraid. The Turkish Secret Service and police, the militaries, they're working really hard. Courtney Keeley, Straight Talk. And for more on Turkey's counter-terror strategy, we are joined by Merve Seren. She's a researcher on intelligence and counterintelligence in Turkey. Thank you for joining us, Merve. It's been eight months since the Reyna attack, and so far we haven't seen major attacks in cities like Istanbul, where we're at. Is this a sign of success as far as Turkish counter-terror measures are concerned? Actually, we cannot say that the rain attack or the, for the eight months as a reference point for, for declaring Turkey's counter-terrorism strategy successful. Actually, we have to look for the last 15 years and we have to evaluate its success or failures according to the events that have been prevented. So just eight months wouldn't, uh, couldn't be taken into consideration as a, 
successful uh, period of time, you know that Turkey has been fighting against the tourism since its establishment, and there are so many various uh, threats to Turkey. So the PKK, Daesh, Daesh KPJ, IPTJ, Asala. So we have, since established Turkey, fight, Turkey's fight against tourism. I mean, Turkey has experience. Uh, and learned many lessons since its establishment uh, with the fight against, uh, since, since her establishment and her engagement with the fight against terrorism. All right, moving forward, we've seen threats in countries like the UK where London has been attacked recently. We've seen threats in New York, all over the world. What more can the Turkish state do to ensure that attacks in major cities don't happen in the future? Well, actually, we have to think that none of the countries, even the United States or the London, uh, none of the, the uh, countries are all capable of, of preventing all of the terrorist attacks. But the main issue here is that how you deal with uh, preventing terrorist attacks. So the risk management, risk prevention, risk preemption facilities are very important for that. And besides that, beyond any doubt, intelligence facilities are the critical play, are the critical factor in order to prevent uh, terrorist threats. Therefore, within the big cities, most of the time, the intelligence facilities of the police uh, plays a crucial role in preventing. Merve Seren, thank you for joining us from Ankara. Gökhan Baytımır, 6 Eylül 1991 doğumluyum. 25 yaşındayım. Doğumu, büyüme İstanbul'dayım. E, dört kardeşiz. En büyükleri benim. 2011 yılında askeri gideceğime dair kağıdım geldi Kasım ayında. Mart ayında 6 aylık göreve gittik Hakkari'ye. Hakkari gergin geçen, her gün bir yerde bir bomba veya taciz ateşleri olan bir yer teröristler tarafından. 4 ay Hakkari Dağlıca İştaş Korukulu'nda kaldım. 19 Haziran 2012 yılında PKK terör örgütünün karakolumuza yapılan baskın sonucu yaralandım. 9 arkadaşımı şehit verdik ve 10, 17 arkadaşım da ben de dahil buna yaralandım. Yaralanma anını hatırlıyorum. Yani el bombası ayağımın altında patladı, yani topumu kopardı. Topum koptuğu zaman da hiç hissetmedim bunu. Kalktım ayağa yani top yaralandığım zaman sıcağı sıcağını hissetmedik. Kalktım ayağa, bir daha yere düştüm. Yani düştüğüm zaman dedim, niye ben bir daha düştüm diye bakayım derken ayağım, topum koptuğunu fark ettim. Yani üç, üç ay sonra yaralandıktan sonra ilk defa evime gelebildim. Arkadaşlarım, komşularımız tarafından güzelce güzel karşılandık burada. Sokamda herkes, benim geleceğim duyan kişiler, herkes sokaktaydı. Yani onları gördüğüm zaman mutlu oldum. Olaydan iki buçuk sene sonra çalışmaya başladım. Devlet tarafından, yani gazi hakkımda olduğundan dolayı devlet tarafından milletime atandım. Bunları bitirmek için biz de vatan görevimizi yerine getirerek yapmaya çalıştık. Yani halk PKK'ya karşı da tepkisini koyduğu için biteceğini ümit ediyorum en kısa sürede. Throughout the show we've discussed internal and external threats facing Turkey from groups like the YPG the PKK and Daesh. But we haven't said anything about an organic threat burrowed deep inside the Turkish state. I'm talking about the Fethullah Gulen network or the Gulenist cult. Turkey says it's a terror group which infiltrated state institutions over a 40-year period. It's built around this man, Fethullah Gulen, a cult-like figure who controls thousands of schools and businesses around the world. Now, he's been living in exile in the United States for almost 20 years. And Turkey says he is the man behind last July's failed coup. So while Turkey contends with threats both inside and outside the country, the question Ankara is asking is why is the U.S. a NATO ally arming groups like the YPG in Syria on one hand and sheltering suspected coup masterminds like Fethullah Gulen on the other. Tell us what you think and we'll share your comments next time. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Ali Mustafa. Until next time, hoşakalın and goodbye.